Hey, GovCon Giants, and we are in the midst of the Russia-Ukraine situation. And for that very reason, I want to bring on a special guest today, Jeff Stutzman, and this upcoming episode. He is the former director of DOD Cyber Crimes, and he now has his own company where they're helping protect small businesses, offering them cybersecurity services as a managed security service provider firm. But this episode is not just for internet folks or cyber people. This is for all small businesses because we, Jeff, and the government believe that because of what's happening right now with the Ukraine invasion, that Russia, as the government starts to sanction them, the Russia is going to have to look for money. And so part of the reason and ways that they're going to do that is by committing uh, cyber crimes and also ransomware attacks. And so in this episode, we discuss all of that. We discuss how you can protect yourself, uh, DIY solutions, and some of the things that you need along the ways to ensure the safety, the security of your organization. Because unlike insurance, right? We When I said to Jeff, hey, this is just like having an insurance policy. He said, no, insurance only pays you out after the crime has been committed. Cyber protects you. It's like putting a huge shield around your entire infrastructure. So as you can imagine with the insurance policy, right? It doesn't restore your system. It doesn't restore customer trust. It doesn't put back all of the things that were part of your network after you've been attacked or invaded, so to speak. Um, so in that sense, this is a defense thwart protection as opposed to resolving the situation after the fact. So I wanted to say that because that was something that I always assumed was like, hey, this is just like insurance. He said, nope, it's a gazillion times better than insurance because you are preventing it from happening to you. And so, again, we discuss low-cost solutions in this upcoming episode. He also shares some really cool stats and shows us some places to go where you can see actually what's happening, right? So he gives us a website that we can go to to see what's actually happening and what these cyber criminals are looking at and how they're actually penetrating and accessing American systems. And I, one of the things that I thought that was pretty fascinating is PlayStation is one of those potential vulnerabilities. So if you want to know all about vulnerabilities and how you can fix that, then this is the episode to tune into. Thank you so much. As always, welcome our next upcoming giant, Jeffrey Stutzman. I'm Jeff Stutzman. I am the CEO of a managed security service provider called Trusted Internet based out of Southern New Hampshire. A um, little, little bit of background. I was a Unix administrator for 10 years, military, uh, turned uh, Navy intelligence officer up in, up in Boston. I got a degree uh, as an enlisted guy in the Coast Guard. And then um, my first duty station as an intelligence officer was the, the Navy's Fleet Information Warfare Center. And so full spectrum information warfare, a lot of the things that we see happening around the world are things that I used to do in the past. So cyber war, psychological operations, all of those kinds of things, all of the pillars of information warfare. In, in uh, 2001, I got out of the Navy, went to work for Cisco and uh, had, had global scope on doing uh, risk management work, um, participated in their M&A process. Um, after that, I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers for about eight months until I realized that that was really not for me. Um, but um, I went to work for uh, Northrop Grumman, Chief Information Security Officer for their electronics business. And about 18 months into that, I got tapped to build out a, a cyber threat analysis and intelligence group, kind of an advanced, an advanced group to make sure that Northrop Grumman stayed free of, of at the time it was Chinese spies. When I, I wrapped up there, I've worked for Carnegie Mellon twice, once as a once as a researcher, once as a principal engineer. So after Northrop, I went up to Carnegie Mellon for a bit, um, and the uh, that was that was one of the one of the coolest jobs ever. But at the same time, when you go from running at 150 miles an hour in a big company chasing spies, you know, doing incident response, and you jump into academia, you throw the brakes on, <laughs> and it and it and it's painful. Um, so they. So they put me on as a uh, as a principal engineer with the DoD Cybercrime Center. I got recruited there and became the GS15 the Dice Director. And um, 2012, I became an entrepreneur. Nice, nice. Yeah, so, I see DoD yeah. Cybercrime Center. Yeah, 
DC three. Wow. Yeah, and I ran I ran the group. Um, in fact, I took it from like nine people to I think fifty people. Mm -hmm. uh, we got budget secured for four years out of Congress. But that was the group that when you when you have to report a um, when you have to report a cyber incident into um, into DOD, you do it over Dibnet at DC3.mil. Dibnet runs right to my office in um, uh, in uh, Linthicum, Maryland. So that's that's what that was. So I built the analytic back end of that. So the people who did you know the analysis of the things that were that were sent in. So Crystal Covey is the is the director now, and she and I worked together years ago. She was. She was a little bit more junior at the time, but now she's she's in charge. It's awesome. She's fantastic. Wow. But yeah. And, and so deep cybersecurity right there in the middle. Defense industrial based cybersecurity. That was in the middle of that menu. Wow. That was yeah, right, up, 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 right there. The IB security, cybersecurity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was the I was the director of this group. DOD DIB collaborative information sharing environment. And so we, you know, we we had a bunch of the big defense contractors that were signed into this information sharing organization, and they would submit artifacts of compromise, and we would go through it and try to figure out if it was if it was espionage related or whatever it was. We could classify it, and then uh, and then we helped them get through it. And there, I guess there are a whole bunch of them now, but uh, at the time uh, I was there, it was about thirty people, thirty companies. You know, the, the largest defense contractors and a bunch of the big banks. In the world. So, was it now again? I'm looking at your, uh, you know, that was 2008, and you started this journey back in 2000. I would say at Northrop Grumman, sounds like you started getting into cyber. Oh, five. That oh, no, I was in cyber before I left, but um. Before I left the military, I mean, it was in, okay. I was an intelligence officer, and my area was computers. So, how would you rate, or how would you categorize the amount of, I guess, attacks then versus today? More sophisticated, faster, um, easier to pull off. I mean, they're at the time, you know, somebody had told me at one point, you know, if you wanted to build a chair when we, we were coming up, you'd have to. You'd go out into the woods and you'd find a tree and you'd chop it down and you'd cut it up and you'd have to manually, you know, cut it into the pieces and figure out how to put a chair together. And today you go to IKEA, <laughs> right? And um, so that's that's the difference between kind of when I came up in this space and 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 today. But today a lot of the tools are a lot of the tools are are point and click. So you know that was the really big deal back then. It was command line. Linux didn't have a GUI. You know, Red Hat was an open source project, mm. and um, yeah, that's there's a big difference. But the but the attacks are are more sophisticated. They're chained together. They're you know especially the ones that are targeted are harder to detect. Uh, the ones that are opportunistic are basically flooding the space, and so they're they're just all over the place. Yeah. Wow. No. Why would you? Uh... Why did you go out and decide to become an entrepreneur? I wanted to do it forever. I've wanted to do this forever, and and um, so in 2012, I, I I started a company called Wapak Labs. It was a cyber threat intelligence company, and we did work with you know a lot of the Wall Street banks and a bunch of companies, and they would sign up, and we would share information, and then and then the market got you know got kind of full with information sharing environments and ISAs and ISACs and Honestly, they were just kind of all over the place. And so we pivoted and we became just pretty much a straight stick intelligence provider. And then um, and then in 2017, I had some I had some personal stuff happen, but it just kind of kind of took my life apart. And uh, and I I ended up stepping away from WAPAC Labs. I gave my equity to my 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 business partners and uh, and at the same time, you kind of get a little bit of time to reflect and you know, kind of think about what's going on. And cyber threat intelligence, man, the value of cyber threat intelligence was rapidly approaching zero. And you can't swing a dead cat today without hitting somebody that's got a cyber intelligence sign on their front door. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, 
when, when you know, most of the people here have no idea what to do with cyber threat intelligence. You can't put it into a lot of, a lot of the devices you know, easily. These companies that I'm dealing with, there's a small percentage of the, of the ones that I was dealing with that could, that could actually use it. So about four years ago, I said, you know what, I'm gonna go into business of just doing it for people. And now I have calls with these guys. And the other day, one of them said, you know what, if you called me to try to sell me intelligence, I wouldn't buy it from you, but you're gonna just take care of this for me. Where do I sign? And that's kind of how it, that's kind of how it goes. That's interesting. I, I, I totally agree with you on that. I, I, my team, so we do a lot of teaching and training, right, of government contracts. We're like, hey, can I just do a, a paid for you service, right? Just do it for me in a box. Just do it. And then they go, no, we want to sell you coaching. I go, listen, if people know what they don't want to be coached, they want right. you to handle it. <laughs> and yeah. they want to pay for you just to handle it. Yeah, um, and, and that's that's where we've come to. So we do it. We charge a fair price. We We use expert level tools. I've staffed a little bit differently. So most of my most of my team have master's degrees and 10 years experience, as opposed to a lot of other folks that are small MSSPs like us. They they typically hire, you know, new college graduates, right? right? Junior level people. Yeah, but you spend more time with those guys. But I do wanna I wanna show you a graphic that I think is really important. I'm gonna share my screen for a minute. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you and I have been talking about you know, CMMC, this is how we met, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had, to, I had to give a talk and I'm getting ready to do this talk again. What you're looking at is the breakdown of the NAICS codes, right? So every every defense contractor has to, has to have a NAICS code. So I went out to the NAICS database and I wanted to find out what the breakdown of company size was by NAICS code. Because it's like the one thing that you can kind of look at across the board. Now, every DOD uh, supplier has to have a NAICS code. And so I thought, well, I can extrapolate these generic NAICS codes and say that, you know, if, if I've got a certain percentage or are under one to four employees, well, that, that must apply to DOD contractors as well. Yeah. Probably pretty close. Maybe not perfect, but, but not, not bad. So I wanted to find out. Especially as it relates to CMMC, because this has been just a quagmire, and and so so here's the deal. The the majority, the overwhelming majority, of defense contractors, if my extrapolation theory is true, um, eighty one percent of the DoD suppliers, the, the dip contract con the companies, have less than ten employees. Mm less than 10 employees and 78 percent of them earn less than a half a million dollars a year now that's that's what's reported so there's you know this fuzzy math that goes into tax term tax returns but but nonetheless those numbers are staggering when you consider that the exercise of going through the the full 800 dfar or the upcoming cmmc is easily 100 grand Easily a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You're gonna. That is going to put these guys out of business. Right. Period. And right. so my, you know, the reason that I put this up was, you know, you go back and you look at some of that stuff. It was written by Johns Hopkins and probably a little bit of Miter and Carnegie Mellon was in there. All these academics who have never operated in an entrepreneurial environment with under ten employees have built this magnificent you know security framework that nobody can afford right and the government didn't do their homework to find out what size companies that they were going to lay these requirements on because the government paints with a wide brush and so so that's it i mean this is this is a really big deal so so now you know as as i'm thinking through what's going on with ukraine i mean look we track it a, because I think it's cool to be able to fa follow those playbooks and build them out for next time, right? That's oh, the way yeah, my brain yeah. thinks. But at the same time, I'm taking that intel and I'm pumping it back into the Fortigate firewalls that we're using to protect our contract companies or our, our, our clients. And we're getting, we're getting data ahead of the curve and we're keeping them protected. So the paperwork that goes with CMMC right now, in my mind, it's important 
But right now, I'd be protecting myself against the fallout, the spillover coming out of Ukraine and Russia. Mm. And so, but this is this is kind of a kind of a staggering. You know, it's interesting. They had a congressional hearing last year that discussed the cost of doing this, and they knew that it was not practical. <laughs> I guess, for lack of a better word. They knew that but they could. They, well, first of all, there was a whole. No one could pin down the actual cost, right? Because they said it depends on the levels. It depends on, right? If you're, uh, and again, mistake me if I'm wrong. If you're like, I guess there's a first tier, second tier, third tier, right? And then so yeah. if, if the requirement was first tier, then it's say twenty thousand. If it was the full shebang, it was a hundred thousand. And so that was an issue. So I did those numbers for Mike Dunbar, Dunbar was the guy that testified. Okay. And, and I handle his cybersecurity. Yes, 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 yes. It was. Okay. And I, I did, and I did the numbers for him that he used to testify before Congress. And this is what it looks like, right? This is, this was kind of a baseline level, middle of the road. If you had to think about the old level three or now the, you know, the level two, right. um, this is this is what you're looking at. You're looking at $81,000 up front. This is probably not complete because it doesn't include pre-audits or post-audits or remediation efforts or any of those kinds of things. It's just how do you get security stood up to be able to go do this? So for a small company, this is a company of roughly 10 people, you're looking at $81,000 and $2,000 a month. And, and I mean, I've already had companies just tell me, I'm not going to do it. If they, if they come after me, I'll go out of business. I'm just going to be done. And yeah, I mean, uh, that's not, that's, uh, again, how, how could you, yeah. if you're making a half a million a year, there's, there's no profit. I mean, you don't have the market. That's right. The margins, no market, away, so right. margins are there to, to sustain them, to do that. Awesome. Yeah. So um, that's interesting. Yeah. But, and this is what I, this is the last one. I'm not going to give you the slideshow, but when I, when I did this before, this is why this is really important, right? You, you got to think in terms of risk. And the government's going to force you to think about compliance, but you need to think about risk. And so this was taken before Ukraine happened. And so, you know, these are the things that I've, that I've kind of circled here. I mean, these are all automated attacks. So as these things are coming into your environment, if you're not set up with the, with the right you know, kind of tools, firewalls, endpoints, incident response plans, those kinds of things. A lot of Bimby, robot network, botnet, steals usernames and passwords. And Ghost Rat, this is one of the original Chinese APT tools. Now it's a remote access Trojan botnet. Um, stealing stuff out of community kit. Mirai is industrial controls and internets of things. But then you come up, right? Netgear, D-Link devices. Microtech routers, these things are all over Ukraine right now. And so if you look at Shodan, Microtech is very, very high on what's exposed to be exploited. So look, I mean, right now, the message that I'm pushing to everybody is you got to do your CMMC. But right now, get those technical things in place that will control and protect you from, from what's happening overseas. You, know, you can figure out the paperwork later, but let's get you set up and, and, and running. So, um, when I see Michael Tick, I think TikTok. Yeah, no, it's not TikTok. TikTok. I know, these are, um, <laughs> yeah, these are these are low cost routers that are used in a lot of a lot of um, a lot of internet service providers around the world, mm. and they're you know and they're compromised. In fact, I've got a client that's got a they're an, an internet service provider in South America, and we've had to build VPN tunnels through them just so that they're not accessible by the by the ISP's routers. And so we so, put our so, devices on each end and we just go, we just go through it and leave it at that. So you know what's interesting is that we we all assume that our ISP is protecting us. Not true. I know your job, that your job is, is to that, is that not yeah. the layman's person's um, yeah absolutely view, right is that our ISP is protecting us. Yeah. We, yeah that's that, true. We, you know, I, I'm just talking because again part of what you know what I'm here to do is to obviously act as a bridge to communicate like what people are thinking about on the other end of this, right? Um, yeah. you know, I, particularly small businesses, uh, we make those types of assumptions. Like, like at the beginning of the call, we said that we believe here in America we're protected. Yeah. So I think that a lot of people 
um, small businesses in particular are thinking that our ISP is protecting us. So there's a couple of places where some of that's happening, right? So the, you know, the Verizon routers and the Comcast has got their new edge stuff and those things are awesome. They're not going to do it because those guys are protecting a lot of people, right? They're not going to be able to protect you or, or me individually. So if you need to really, you know, kind of think about routing and stuff like that, you're going to have to go above and beyond that. But, but no, the ISPs are there to move data from point A to point B. They provide the pipe and they want to, they want to make sure that you have uptime and, and everything that you want to do is going to be there. But, you know, historically it's, it's not been the ISP providing the security. Uh, so the ISP is not providing security. A full CMMC is, you know, 81 to hundred thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is the little guy to do? So I, I mean, the way I approach it is we have, we have kind of a standardized architecture. I'm just going to stop sharing. We have a, we have a standardized architecture mm -hmm. and, and I, I use it in my house. So I've got two homes, one in New Hampshire and one in West Virginia. So I'm in West Virginia right now. And the architecture that we put together is um, at, at, at the smallest level will cost about, about $3,000 all in, plus some installation charges, whatever, and maybe $1,000 a month total to, to, to monitor, manage, protect 24 seven. And so the idea was that when I went into the MSSP business, I had no intention of doing work with government compliance or any of that. So I built a model. Um, I built a model that was both affordable and it would get you to the 80% mark. And if we had to go up higher, we could ratchet that up, but you have to know to get that extra 20%, you know, there are other tools and things that we have to apply and it's gonna cost you more money. And so we, if we could knock down 80% of the threats that are coming in the door, you know, a mom and pop pizza place that's protecting our cash register or dentist's office or something like that would be totally fine with this. And then, and then I started getting pulled back into, you know, government stuff. And I made it, I made it a point to not put myself in the politics of CMMC. It's just, just a, it's a fool's game, right? To, to try to knock your head against that. But, but the, uh, here, here's the deal. We, de we, we deploy two applications on every computer, uh, a, a managed antivirus and then an anti-evasion. And we could also do uh, an EDR, an endpoint detect and response system. We use CyberReason for that. And so we've got a combination of one of these two or we can use CyberReason. And then what that does is that gives us the ability to centrally monitor and manage and protect at the endpoint level 24 seven. And that's what we do. And we, you know, we use smart tools. So there's some, machine learning built into the things that we do. And everybody's saying that there's AI and there probably is somewhere. I don't know what it means, but I know what I know what AI means, but I don't know. It's kind of a black box, right? When you plug it into it's absolutely a black box. next gen firewall. So the, um, you know, up, up the stack, we use FortiGate firewalls and we use FortiGate firewalls because they cost the same as a Meraki or a Sonic wall or one of those things that are meant for ease of management, right? They're like a little bit above consumer grade. They're still really good firewalls, but they're not a lot of bells that you can ring and knobs that you can, or buttons to push and levers to pull if you find yourself in trouble. So we like to use FortiGate firewalls, very fast and very efficient. Total cost of ownership is really good. So any traveler gets a VPN. Uh, oh, I should go back, right? These next generation firewalls are built with functionality. I mean. The firewall is nothing more than a picket fence. Uh, think of, think of uh, intrusion prevention as the bouncer that stands inside the picket fence or, or a pit bull or whatever it is you want inside that's, that's looking at everything that's coming through that, that fence. And antivirus is you know, something in the house that you're protecting that if a bug comes in, you can kill the bug. And so the, um, these, these next generation firewalls have a lot of functionality built in, cloud functionality, brokering functionality, DNS filtering, anti-malware, intrusion prevention systems. And for about, for roughly $2,000, you can get a good one that'll give you up to a gigabyte of, of bandwidth coming in. So it's not crazy money. And then, you know, VPNs back to that firewall. If you're traveling, you want to be protected by the firewall. So either you can, 
you can go and you can log into your own firewall for remote access, or you can log into mine. And I've got mine. I've got one set up just for this in Iron Mountain data centers. So you can you can phone back to one of my firewalls. In fact, for for some of these one person CMMC required shops, we've got we got a whole slew of clients that are one person, and maybe they have two or three computers. And instead of putting a hard firewall in their office because they don't have one, uh, we put them on a VPN that always connects to my firewall in, in North Road, Massachusetts. That works out pretty well. But anyway, that that very simple architecture is is not expensive. You're getting firewalls and endpoints and training and email protection and incident response capabilities because we bring that to the table. And those are the places of risk that really need to be covered to be able to get you to that 80% mark. Now, if you find out that you're, you're, getting, you're getting hit by espionage attacks or APT events, or the government comes back and says, we've got some things that are more sensitive and we layer on the things that we need to do to get you to you know, the next level. And that's gonna be more expensive. Right? Okay, like, it's like uh, having insurance. Better than having insurance because you're not waiting for the tree to fall on your deck or somebody to run into your car or mayhem to strike. You're, you're you're actually protecting against that. It's right. So, right. you know, one of the comments that I, I tell people is, yeah, I always hear that, right? It's like having an insurance policy. No, it's not. It's like building a dome around my house so that the missiles can't hit me. Mm. That's what it is. And and um, so let's let's talk about the insurance for a second because this is oh, a really big deal. Everybody says I've got insurance. I don't need to have protection. Oh no, I didn't think that, but I I know but, insurance like gives that, you money, but it other doesn't. Other people are pay. thinking that, so let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So number one is insurance doesn't fix the pain; they only give you money. So if 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 you lose, you know, sixty percent of your data to a ransomware event, or all of your data to a ransomware event, and you decide not to pay because you're going to get reimbursed by insurance, you still have to reconstitute your business. They're not going to do it for you. Mm. They may give you some money, but they probably will. Maybe not anymore because the cyber insurance policies, we're seeing rates anywhere between 50% and 500% increases. And they'll only write to a limit of about $5 million. And the deductibles are enormous, right? So we're seeing a massive change in, in cyber insurance policies this year. And we're getting a lot of phone calls as a result. So we've had, we've had really good luck with insurance companies looking at the architecture that we put in that low cost architecture and going, okay, you're going to be on the lower end of, of rate increases instead of the, the monster end of, of rate increases. Mm -hmm. So that's been kind of cool. They like the architecture. What are, what are, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that I didn't think that insurance companies, but it does make sense that they would look at what things are you doing to try to prevent this stuff from happening to you in order to determine your deductible and your rates. And I guess it's yeah. like someone smoking versus non-smoking, right? Your policy. Well, it's no different than, you know, a lot of them now have that thing that you can plug into your car. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. It's yes. the same thing. And right. uh, they want to know that you are trying to manage What's your own risk. Right. Right. Not just relying. And, the, and what did it was the ransomware payouts. They were just huge, you know, across the board. So, you know, there was really no good way for the insurance companies to predict that. Do you have any data or a slide on ransomware payouts or an increase or anything like that? No, but I'll tell you, three years ago. I know you have a good story on ransomware. I have a great story. <laughs> um, yeah, so three years ago, four years ago now, I'm having dinner in New Hampshire. And I get a phone call and it kind of goes like this. Hey, Jeff, how fast can you be in Houston? And I said, oh, what's going on in Houston? They said, well, there's a three and a half billion dollar company that's been ransomed and it's on day four. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, usually you get three days on the keys and, and then you're in trouble. And so, so I fly down, I got the CEO and the chief security officer in a room and they kind of lay it out. Here, here's what we have. And the CIO, good guy, just, you know, too far over his skis on this one. He just has no clue what he's what he's dealing with, and and he's got a daughter that was graduating from college that weekend, and he couldn't miss it. So we said, "All right, you go on." I took over, and uh, we we found out, of course, that that it was a ransomware, and we 
made a couple of emails and they wanted $1.2 million. Now it's after hours. And this is, this is kind of a big deal at the time. And they didn't have a lot of the reporting things, but we did call the FBI. And there are a whole lot of lessons learned. Believe me, this could be an entire podcast on lessons learned and how the story progressed. But long story short is we found that uh, every time we, you know, we fixed something, it would be, well, I mean, long story short is we ended up paying $700,000 in an after hours ransom. And we were able to get it down to that price because that's all we could get in an after hours wire. And, and um, so we paid it out over about three and a half hours. And every half hour, we put $100,000 in, in Bitcoin into the internet. And, and, and after, we were in a little office. It was like three of us in a little office. And after the last payment, the guy on the other end goes, okay, thank you, see you. And I'm like, oh. And the, you know, the guys in the office are like, Jeff, is this going to work? And I've got that, I've got to put the game face on. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> if, if you don't pay, you know, if they don't give us a key, nobody will ever pay them. And so right. I said, this is going to work. And, and, you know, it was like, I want to say it was about four hours after. And we're just sitting in the office waiting. And I'm hitting refresh on, you know, on my Proton account. Refresh, refresh, refresh. And finally, we had a key. And, and the key didn't work. And so they put me in touch with their help desk. No. We have a key, yeah. Wait, yeah. wait, wait. Hold on, wait. You can say they, the people. The attackers. The attackers had a help desk. Yeah. They had a whole group set up, and I ended up communicating with those guys over Proton. And sure enough, we got a key within a few minutes. Wait, say over Proton. Proton. Proton mail. It's just a, <clears throat> a secure mail, so like no tracking type thing. Okay. Yeah. So you always have something like that that you use that's out of band because you don't, you know, you don't want to use the, you know, the, the Microsoft Office and the, you know, the exchange in the company and you can't. But it was what was interesting was that was that thing was being, you know, spread every time we would decrypt something, it would get re-encrypted because it was it was attached to the the backup system, mm -hmm. and so the backup system would do an incremental every two hours. And every time it would go out, it would reinfect that computer. So we would, we would, you know, be de uh, decrypted. It'd be, we'd have it back, and then two hours later, it was re-encrypted again. So, so we chased it, chased it, chased it. We finally figured, we finally found some code that we were able to reverse engineer. And when we did, we saw what it was doing, and it had embedded uh, basically roaming profiles inside the backup system. You know, no backup system should ever need roaming profiles. And so we figured it out. Um, but yeah, that was it. And so I've been the, you know, the chief information security officer for that company for, for the last four years, the four years of May, uh, as, as a result of that. Wow. Yeah. And so we've done a number, we've done a number of ransomware cases. And, you know, some of them you win, some of them you don't, some of them you have to pay, some of them you won't. But yeah, that's, but the, but just just you know having tracked you know the stuff in Ukraine this is my fear we're gonna we're gonna see another event on the scale of not Fetchia. not Fetchia was was deployed it went like wildfire around the world and at the same time we saw you know other operators coming in below the noise uh, warfare operators coming in below the noise siphoning off data while we were all reacting to this massive ransomware event. And so whether it's intentional or unintentional, right now, if you look at, if you look at Shodan, there are roughly a million open ports in Ukraine. And, and that's significant because those are potential openings, you know, what the people can touch and, and do things with. But there are 238 million openings in the U.S. right now on Shodan. And it's, you know, you're going to say that's a bigger country. It doesn't matter. It's wildfire, right? So if they use something on and something in Ukraine and it happens to spill outside that that environment, we could all be in trouble. Tell me now, let's let's go back because you're I'm trying to look it up as we're speaking. What show that? Shodan.io. Yeah. So so basically what Shodan does is they they scan the internet all the time looking for open ports, vulnerabilities, open web cameras, things like that. And, and so in fact, webcams are one of the are one of the biggest things that we see always compromised when we go in and we deploy something. But um, 
yeah, if you go up and just look at like uh, images or something like that, you can, I think they allow you to do it. No, maybe not. I can. I can log in. You can log in. If I can choose my Google, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, so. I'm gonna buy it. Yeah, I mean, I have a paid account on it, but, but the, uh, yeah. Yeah, all right, go ahead. I'm yeah. Tell you what, let me, let me just, uh, oh, wait, 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 hang on. Do um, click on bottom right where it says open ports in the US, but down, 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 right there. Click on that. It's circling, so it's it's going. It takes a minute. And there are a whole bunch of different things that you can query in this vulnerabilities. Um, there it is, analyzing vulnerabilities in the network or open holes that shouldn't be open, or you see hacked websites. Okay. All right, so these are these are all of all of the ports, 233, 689, 495. These are all ports that are available that are being you know, advertised publicly um, across the US. That doesn't mean that they're all gonna be hackable, but there are 233.6 million targets that are available, right? Either the, now look at, just pull it up on the map, click the map view on the, right under the search bar. Nope. Map view so under country US. Yeah. Right there. Go down three. Yeah. Right there. Click on view on map. Uh, uh, okay. Right. Ah. okay, never mind. It's not gonna let you do it with your with your free account. Yeah. But it but it's kind of cool because it'll it'll bring up a map and show you. I don't worry about it. Don't put your credit card here. Exactly. But, I was like, I was so, like, I was I wasn't gonna put my I was thinking but, like, hey. <laughs> yeah. But it brings up, you know, you could see it in graphic format, which is kind of cool because, you know, it's an easier message to communicate. Right. And, um, yeah. But explain, you could still talk us through it. So talk us through what I'm looking at. All right. So, website. yeah. So, you, so right now, that, that one up top is an SSL certificate that's being advertised. And it just basically says, hey, there's an open port that's giving you SSL, a website welcome, whatever that is. The next one right. down is Northern Virgi Virginia Amazon. Right. right. So bad guys can go through this, filter their queries and look for things that are vulnerable and they can use that to detect what's going on. Mm. From my perspective, I just look at it and go, OK, um, I use it as situational awareness. You can kind of look at it very quickly and figure out. So top operating systems, Ubuntu, Linux, Debian's and then Sonic Walls, right? 267 Sonic Walls, Asus WRT. So go down to that right down. Keep going. Okay, bottom left, yep, right there. Right. So don't you don't have to click on that, but but when you see WRT, yep. WRT is basically the router, open source router inside of a, a wireless device. Or it could be, it could have been written, but but in this case, there are a whole bunch of ASUS routers that are out there. Those WRT are kind of famous because you can overwrite WRT mm -hmm. and reflash a, a wireless router and turn it into a keystroke logger. And for the longest time, the, we were watching a lot of the ports around the world had been compromised with keystroke loggers. So usernames and passwords are being captured. And then it was screenshots of whatever they did with it. And um, I mean, it was pervasive, just millions and millions and millions of compromised accounts as a result of having keystroke loggers or overwritten WRT. In fact, we had a, we had a client out in California, there you go, 231,000 of them. Uh, we had a client out in California, and this client had had a, uh, her wireless router who was overwritten in her home, and she was a money manager, and she had $80,000 stolen from her accounts because they had captured the usernames and passwords by overwriting that. Look at all those MicroTik routers. Right, that's what I was going to say. That's what you showed me on your other learning MicroTik. Yep. Yeah, and then, so they captured the usernames and passwords and then they decided they wanted to change the pin numbers on her card. So they stole her telephone number and put, ported it from Verizon to Google. So when she called Verizon, they had no knowledge of who she was. And even though she'd been a client for 10 years or whatever it was, but the- uh, The, the numbers didn't match number, the computer, so they don't know any different. I don't know. Yeah, the so people that's, are taking so a future phones, they don't know, they don't know. Yeah. So that's what happened. They, they, they called the bank. They changed over her 
her passwords and her PIN numbers, and they went to the ATM and started withdrawing money. $82,000 later, we get a phone call. So yeah, I was in I was in DC, flew out, spent a couple of days where it was kind of funny because I had a young guy with me wearing a suit and, and she thought he was the boss. And so I, re I rewired the house and you know he sat with her and changed usernames and passwords and <laughs> got her on two-factor authentication. And we still operate as her, as her CISO as well. But, but yeah, you can run right down the line here, right? So there's a SonicWall OS 5X and maybe somebody will look at that and go, oh, that's an old version. Maybe I'll go after that. Yeah. Or PlayStation 4, we love, we oh, love those. Like, I'm like PlayStation 4? Yeah, because they're online. It's a computer. Wow. In fact, those gaming systems are, you know, that's, that's a favorite. It's a favorite target. Now, you, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was that when you go into places, you said the webcams? I have, we have not failed yet. And um, so one of the lessons that we learned in 2014 with Russia, Ukraine was that the, the Russians were spying on the Ukrainians using the traffic cameras, smart TVs, and webcams. And yeah, it was big. And, and so that's how they were tracking movement of key people and things like that. And they were in the phones and so when I started the MSSP, one of the first things that we noticed was, well, one of the first things that we knew were a lot of the cameras, surveillance cameras like Hike Vision has ports built in, they're backdoored, um, so you've got to protect them with firewalls. But the place that we, we never, ever fail is when we put a firewall in, one of the first things that we see compromised is the physical security system, the physical security protection, right? So video surveillance systems, cameras, uh, network video recorders, those are almost always compromised because they're embedded windows or embedded Linux and they're just left out there. And these guys that are running these, these physical security systems don't know enough to up update the firmware you know, every so often. I mean, they could be making more money than that. They're leaving money on the table, mm -hmm. which kills me. But the fact is, is they should be doing the maintenance on these systems where they're keeping the operating systems up to date, the firmware up to date, those kinds of things. So when you buy one of these systems, you have no idea how long it's been sitting on the shelf, unupdated, and then it's going to get installed. And maybe they'll do a firmware update then, but mm -hmm. that's probably the last one that it'll have. And so these things are really unprotected. Even if they say SSL encrypted on the box, you know, that's what they print on the boxes. Yeah, that's what they put on the box. But <laughs> but the fact is, is that databases have to decrypt to be able to do read and write operations. So if you're taking 60 frames per second from a whole bunch of cameras and it's going to one, you know, one box, excuse me, one NVR, then um, that NVR is constantly decrypted so it can do the read and write of 60 frames per second from all those cameras. Mm. It's going to get compromised. Wow. Every time. So, so we've built out the reference architecture to be able to protect those as well. Let's talk about, all right, we'll spend our last uh, you know, 20 minutes or so talking about Russia, Ukraine. In the okay. beginning, when we opened up, you said that CMMC is one issue, but the Russia, Ukraine fallout, and we talked about the sanctions on Russia and locking down their bank accounts, there might be some fall as a result of that. Yeah, here's here's my here's my take on this right now. I mean, look, CMMC is important. BFAR 800-171, it's important. But they threw the kitchen sink at these small contractors. And and if I were a defense contractor, the the thing that I'd be concerned with now is how do I stay in business? How do I how do I continue to do operation in this heightened state of of tension in the world? And I think it's going to get worse. So, and again, you can't make some of this stuff up, right? So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of take you back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story from presidential election back in 2014 in Ukraine. So somebody, somebody hacked the Ukraine central election computer system and they trojaned it. And that thing was putting out false numbers. Mm -hmm. And those false numbers were being reported all over Ukraine and on Russian television station one, which is on the eastern border. When when the Ukrainians found out that it was that it was doing this, in fact, 
at the time, one of the presidential elections was being reported as having 37% of the vote, but in fact, they had less than 1%. He had less than 1%. Wow. So the numbers were staggering. And so the when the Ukrainians found out that that um, that there was a Trojan on this machine, they took it offline and they went to you know telephone voting. And then all of a sudden we started seeing the pro-Ukraine portions of the country, they had no telephone service. They were doing telephone denials of service. And the only people who could vote were the pro-Russian parts of the country. And the same thing with computers, they were doing denials of service on the internet selectively. So this is sophisticated stuff, right? Not, not crazy, but the targeting is good. The intel is really good. So the, the, you know, the, the concern is that cyber is not new. It's just another part of warfare. And in all things warfare, there's collateral damage, right? So if I, if I aim a missile at a, at a, at a, certain, at a certain target, and you know, there's a high probability that you know, my aim could be off and, and people around that target will also be killed. Civilians, collateral damage. And it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. In cyber, it's kind of the same way. If, if I go to do something with an automated high-speed botnet and I want it to go take out a certain thing, there's a high, very high probability that that piece of malware that's being used, ransomware, malware, reconnaissance, whatever, is going to escape the target area of the battlefield. Intentional or unintentional, right. it's going to come out. Right. And that's the concern that I have right now. So the Ukraine has a, has a group in, I think it's Telegraph, that's about 175,000 members, and they call themselves the IT Army. Interesting. Anonymous has taken up the cause. Um, there are hacker groups all over the place. So this is what's happening here is we're starting to see, I hate to use the term fog of war, the phrase fog of war, but but with all of these people that are jumping in, there you go. Uh, if you know, all these people that are jumping into the fray, there is a very, very high probability that that the tools that are being used in here are going to escape the battlefield and other people are going to be affected by it. So, you know, if I had to, if I had to make a hard prediction, because of the sanctions, Russia's, you know, got a financial stranglehold. Um, we're, we're going to see some backlash. It's going to be targeted attacks against our, our banking community. And this happened in the past. It's the same process. And we're going to see denials of service against other parts of the country. Um, we, we know that you know, they're looking for a way to get money. So what's the easy way to make money? Ransomware. And so we're going to see ransomware. It's going to happen because they, want to, they need money. They're going to need money. And we saw this out of North Korea a few years ago when Lazarus was doing that, you know, hitting the central bank of, I forget what it was, but it's an easy way to make money and it's an easy way to bypass the banking community because it's all paid in Bitcoin. So, so number one, we're going to see, we're going to see activities, cyber activities meant for warfare escape the battle space. That's number one. And Number two, we're going to see post-sanction ransomware events and direct targeting of banks. And the ransomware events are going to be paid in Bitcoin, and that's going to fund some of this. So there might be even some bigger, you know, bigger targeting going on there. Those are the things that I think are coming. So if you're, you know, if you're one of those small defense contractors that we talked about, any small company, I mean, DHS right now is running a campaign called Shields Up. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's perfectly named. And right now, if you are not thinking about how fast can I get a firewall in front of my network and have somebody that knows what they're doing watching this stuff, you're going to be in trouble. It's that simple. And I don't want to say the sky is falling, but boy, there's a heightened risk and the writing is on the wall. And you have to know that's that's what's happening right now. That's that's the risk. That's a lot. It's a lot. That's a lot to I've been preparing for this for a long time, though, dude. So how, how many times do we have to say you got to have a firewall? You got to have an antivirus. You have to have two-factor authentication. 
you have to have something looking at your email, right? So the, the vast majority of the things that we see are email based. And then it's credential stuffing and then it's drive by downloads. And you got to be able to protect the users. I work with, I'm also a defense contractor and I have projects with NAVFAC. Um, and a lot of times, because of their protections and securities, I can't even get information across to them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know. Emails, I mean, it, 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 it makes it a challenge to work. You're talking about NMCI or just the interface between you and them? Uh, interface, sending large emails. Uh, sometimes they have to do, um, they send us an email with a link. I forgot the name of the system. And then you upload your file to that, to that system. It authentic, it checks it. And yeah. you know, um, there's just, I forgot the name of that system they use, but yeah, it, there's an army. I think it's called like safe or something like yeah, that. Yeah, safe. There you go. That's right. That's it. Safe, safe port, safe, safe. Yeah. Yeah. Deal D safe or something to that effect. Um, yeah. And the, you know what? Those are, those are good and they're doing the right things, but they definitely, you know, it's, yeah, it's, been made, it's been made harder, but the fact yeah, is, is the threat landscape has gotten significantly worse. So, and right, right now the risk is high. No, no. Now, all right. We, we, you know, we get the overarching theme. And, and when we say defense contractor, do you, are you considering DOD and non-DOD contractors? Yeah, I do. I mean, look, I, I say defense contractors because you and I are having a, a defense related discussion, but the fact is, is that. I mean, if, if I'm saying, for example, if you're serving national parks, right? Yeah. In fact, I just got a contract with a bunch of them. So there, I mean, look, it's, it's all kinds of stuff, right? Could Vegas survive a catastrophic event in cyberspace today? Right. No. I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't Vegas, know. You know, I mean, look, we hear about the critical infrastructures and all of that kind of stuff, but, yes. but you know, most mom and pop shops have a, have a computer driven cash register, a square terminal or, you know, whatever it is. And, um, I mean, look, that's, those are little things, but manufacturing centers, right? Manufacturing sites with, with industrial controls and internets of things. And I mean, I used to work in a place that had robots that were putting chips on boards oh. and, you know, and could those survive? I mean, they're on Windows 95 and Windows NT because that's what they were built on and you can't replace it because the machine won't work. Right, right. Right, so, right. so you know, when you go across the board and we've got maybe all these non-critical suppliers, they're making a couple of million dollars a year. It's enough to support the, the families and the employees. And, right. you know, I would hate to see those guys go offline because they didn't have a $2,000 firewall. Right. right. Makes no sense to me. No, that's fair. So, that's, fair. that's fair. And, and it's, when you say that, that actually reminds me, we talk about suppliers. Um, I drive a Ford Expedition. When I went to Ford, right? To, I mean, I mean, I went to the dealership, right? It's beautiful dealership. It's all fancy, but then when they go to order a part, <laughs> I, I said, "Why are you printing out a piece of paper?" They said, "Oh no, no, we have to print out this order form, and then we have to fax it to the company, and then it comes. Someone from there picks it up, then they go into a system that they then check against. So even though on my computer it may say available, until they check that system, we don't really." Yeah. And I go, are, I go, are you kidding me? This is cool. I, know. I just bought, I just bought a Volkswagen Atlas. So I had a, I had a diesel Volkswagen Touareg for yeah, 270,000 miles, right? I drove it forever. Uh, and so I just had to finally get a new one. And as I was looking around, I was considering these other models. They're all about the 40 to $50,000 range. That's, uh, I don't want to, I don't even want to spend that much on a car. But right, I well, well, nowadays cars are, I mean. It's crazy. It's to, so, Everything is crazy. So, so one of my buddies says, hey, you should go look at a Cadillac. Go look at one of those blah, 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 whatever. I don't even know. So I go and I test drive one. And the guy says, oh, yeah, listen, the sticker says it has all these features, but we couldn't get the chips. So, so Cadillac is just going to, they're just going to either credit you or when the chips come in, we'll do the install. And I'm like, no. You're going to charge? Yeah. Get out of here. But they couldn't get the chips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Wow. Wow. Anyway. Well, so yeah, this this is this is interesting times that we're living. These are interesting times that we're dealing with right now. 
No, these are interesting times. And uh, like I said, the narrative I, certainly has changed. I haven't heard any news on COVID in the last week. Very true. <laughs> That's very. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it back around and being silly because that's the Jeff that I know. So okay, like the narrative change. We have somebody, our COVID. Somebody week. paid off Russia to invade you know Ukraine to change the narrative. I, think. I don't know. Well, yeah. Somebody's like, look, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's a that's a positive uh, outlook yeah. of what's happening. Like, no, that's totally not true. No, totally okay. not true. You're yeah. going to see that show up on on you know some websites. Yeah. No, I know. No, definitely. Uh, Let's let's uh, and again, I'm sure we could talk about this for a long time, but for the purposes of uh, respectful people's times, let's um, again. We know that your 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 advice is to, to is to involve, install a system. Uh, anything else people should be considering when you know? What about if I'm looking at doing it myself? Yep. Right. So it's it's the same thing. You can do it yourself. So you know we use. In certain cases, we use Cisco devices. In certain cases, we use Fortinet. The Cisco Meraki's are fairly easy to manage. If you want to do it yourself, go, go up on Amazon and buy a Cisco Meraki, the appropriate size that you need and plug it in. Now, we don't, we don't use a lot of them because we like the features and we're all certified in Fortinet. But, but if you had to do it that way, so make sure that you've got you know, all of your strong antivirus. And so there's, you know, in my mind, there are kind of you know, a handful of basic things that that you must do to mitigate any of this stuff. Firewall, we just talked about that. Um, if, uh, I mean, we use, we use FortiGate, we use FortiClient for antivirus yeah. because it talks to the firewalls. We like that a lot, but there are other options that are very good too. So I'm a Mac user and I really like Sophos on my Macs. And so you could go download a copy of Sophos. And in fact, it's cheap. Um, so good antivirus, good firewalls, Make sure that you are, you know, when you're when you're out and about, that you're, you know, your VPN and back to your back to your firewalls. Two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is one of the simplest things that you could do, and I'm so happy I don't have to remember passwords like I used to. So you get a code, right? And yep. Maybe you have a password, but you get a code back. So firewalls, endpoints, two-factor authentication. Email is the number one place where you're going to see attacks coming in. It's just the number one threat factor. So we, you know, we like a tool called Avanon. You can use it on O365 or Google. And it also drop, you know, you can pay a little bit more and and have it monitor your box and Dropbox accounts and things like that. And we have that under 24-7 too, but you could easily do that. You could easily do that yourself. Most of the companies that we deal with just don't have the time to do it through themselves or engineering. They want to be engineers, not information yeah. security people so we do it for them so firewalls endpoints antivirus right two-factor authentication protect your email and then know what to do if you've got a problem right so know how to react in instant response if you need to just take some cycles write down a plan try it once or twice see if it works um and know who to call if you get in trouble which would be me Stay safe online at trustedinternet.io. We're here to help. My man, Jeff. <laughs> My man, Jeff. My man, Jeff. My man, no, but seriously, I mean, you, you, you folks could do this for themselves. Most of them just don't have time. They don't want to go on the learning curve adventure. The learning curve is not crazy, but it's not simple either. Jeff, what was your last Amazon purchase? most recent that made you happy? I bought fender caps for my two, my 1990 Toyota 4Runner that I'm restoring in my garage. Why are you restoring a 1994 runner? Because I always wanted one of those old 4Runners, but when I was young and they came out new, I couldn't afford one. Oh, and so I had a- about that nostalgia? I love these things. They are just beasts. It's a little Hilux. So I, I had a 1993 Toyota uh, pickup that I bought when I was an E4 in the Coast Guard. And I drove it for 28 years. And then it sat in the driveway during COVID because none of, nobody in my family could drive a stick but me. Mm. And so it sat in the driveway during COVID and, uh, and it rotted out. And because uh, I was in West Virginia, my, my wife is a registered nurse. So, so it rotted out. 
So I sold it for $1,500. And then I was kind of in mourning because I'd had this truck for so long. Love this thing. It was like an old glove. Yeah, and so yeah. I'm driving through West Virginia and I see this forerunner in somebody's road. It's, uh, I call it the West Virginia lawn or right? Dead car in the front lawn. And, and so, so I just pulled in. I said, this guy, I said, the old guy says, I think for sale. He goes, everything's for sale here. And I said, okay, well, what do you, what do you want for it? Does it run? He fires it right up, starts right up. I said, well, what do you want for it? He says, well, I got $3,800 into it. And I said, well, how about 15? I got $1,500 cash here in the truck. So I bought it, brought it back, put it in the, put it in the garage. And then I've been just rebuilding it piece by piece. I changed all the gaskets to stop the oil leaks. I, you know, just did a bunch of work on the electrical system because the previous owner had done a hillbilly fix and shorted it out, right? They put a just right. crazy stuff. It's, you know, it's 30 years old, so it's going to have some of that stuff. Yeah. And um, my wife. And um, so it's just, there are two things that I like to do when I'm not doing security. One is I fish a lot. I fish a lot. So I'm right on the river. And the, and the second is, um, the second is I like to fix this old car. And so the reason, the, the way that I broke my, my, my leg, my foot was that I was, uh, I, had a, I had a little project. I wanted to build some bumpers and I was gonna use this thing one time. So I called around a couple of pawn shops looking for a treat, cheap drill press, found one, 50 bucks, went out, picked it out, was carrying it out and stepped in a pothole and broke my ankle. So now I'm sitting here in a, in a boot for the next two weeks and it's okay. I can still weld on that thing. It's, I don't have to move too much. Oh, there you go. So you didn't yeah. drop the drill press. <laughs> I did. It went one way and I went the other. So I had the brand new Atlas. I, it, it still works. I plugged it in when I got back. It still works. I'm shocked. But so I was heading towards the Atlas. So that drill press went one way and I went the other. And um, yeah, yeah. And I was, there was no bourbon involved, I swear. No okay. bourbon. All right, Jeff. All right. I, I, you know, <laughs> I assume there was not. I did. There was not. I would assume there was not any bourbon involved, you know. By the way, if uh, folks don't know, Jeff likes bourbon, so. Yeah, Jeff likes, likes bourbon and cigars. This is, yeah, when we were at the 8A conference, uh, they, you know, tried to bring me in on them, some bourbon cigars. That's how we make friends. Yeah, but I got pulled friends. a lot of different directions that night. It's, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, because all of my friends that I knew from online, that my guests and podcasts that I never met in person, so. Uh, we had we had a good time though. we had a little crowd going around that fire. And I saw you guys at the back over there by the fire pit all the way towards the back. Yeah. 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 Very, yeah. Very proud and we of raffled off a couple of bottles in the in the in the booth and yeah, yeah. and we'll do that again. That was that what's was the really uh great. what's the next event you guys are gonna be at? Uh well we just did this the Sammy in um uh northern Virginia. That was that was last Wednesday. Okay. And then um doing one on Gosh, I don't know. You know what? I've got a marketing admin that kind of just tells right. me where to go. No, no. I but mean, I'm gonna I mean, do I'm gonna do the 8A in Anchorage in the summer. Oh, you are absolutely. Yeah, that'll be good. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I'm no, um, because I'm gonna probably do Hub Zone, which is usually up there in Virginia. I'll I'll do also, that. um I'm up I'm up in the northeast a lot, so you know, put me on your radar for the next event. So that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, you know, I don't know the events. I'm not tracking them but as you are. But yeah. again, we're working in the same places. So, well, listen, I mean, I'm, I'm an hour and a half west of DC. So if you get up here in the area, give me a call. Yeah. Well, I don't get to DC. I get up to Rhode Island. So if you're in oh. New Hampshire, of course. Oh, yeah, I'm in southern New Hampshire. In fact, yeah. I was just on WMUR. Um, yeah, I'm actually, Hampshire. I'll probably be flying up to Rhode Island and head up to uh, Newburyport. It's our other office. So, really? Um, yeah, Newburyport, Mass, man. How far is wow. that? Going? We go there a lot. We have an office I, there. I had no idea. Yeah. We'll have to oh, we were we had so much going on that day that we were talking. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, we have a place out in Newburyport. So I, I go that. there every time I'm in Rhode Island. I go to Newburyport. Yeah. I stay in Rhode Island because we have projects in Connecticut at the sub base, and we have projects at Naval Station, Newport, the War College. Uh, but we also have projects for national parks at Hanscom Air Force Base. And then we have projects at downtown Boston. And then, so we have, yeah, we have a place up there and we have staff out of New Hampshire. And actually uh, the main, our main admin person lives in New Hampshire. Wow. I don't know what part, though, but, she, but she lives so by I'm, a big I'm lake. Right, up I'm there. right outside the Air Force Base in New Boston. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, perfect. I know. Well, now it's that. now it's the space based. You, you know what? They changed my base to the space base here. Uh, <laughs> so the logo looks like Star Trek. Yes, it does. Yeah. My base used to be uh, Patrick Air Force Base. Now it's Space Force something base. Uh, uh, they did that all over. So yeah, with a black logo and all that, it's kind of cool. No, no, good stuff, Jeff. Look, t- yeah. tell the people some uh, shining words of wisdom, and then I'll close you out, brother. Shining words <laughs> of wisdom. And you're killing me. I don't know. What's the shining words of wisdom? Look, I, I tell you, know. me I mean, help. the thing the thing right now is don't be afraid, be smart. Don't be afraid, be smart. Doesn't cost you much to lay some protection in to keep yourself from, from being victimized by what's going on overseas. So be smart, be confident about it. If you need some help, give somebody a call. Doesn't have to be me, but there's a lot of smart people out there that can that can do this stuff for you. Um, other than that, be safe and do well. And your website is trustedinternet.io. Trustedinternet.io. Yep. That's it. All right, Jeff. As we will have all of your information, your contact information, everything that you want us to share, we'll have it on our website as well. And for those viewers that are listening, uh, Jeff's on LinkedIn. And again, we'll put his website, his email, contact information, everywhere that you listen to the GovCon Giants podcast. Jeff, don't hang up. We're going to close out and uh, we'll just chat for a few minutes afterwards. All right. You got it. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the GovCon Giants podcast.